this, 1 over mu, because 1 over mu would be m1 plus m2 over m1 m2, right? Mu is m1 m2 over m1 plus m2, so 1 over mu is m1 plus m2 over m1 m2, but that's 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2. Going back to how we said that that when you're doing the reduced mass, the, the reciprocal of reduced mass is the sum of the reciprocals of the masses, just like when you add resistors in parallel to one another. The reciprocal of the equivalent resistance is the sum of the reciprocals of the resistances. <coughs> so by cosmic coincidence that works the same way. So E is equal to 1 half mu squared over mu b squared, or in other words, 1 half mu b squared. minus g m u over r. But that's exactly what you would get for if you had a fixed mass m having a little mass, having another mass mu orbiting it, the gravitational potential energy would be minus g m u over r, and the kinetic energy, because big M is fixed, all belongs to mu, and it would be 1 half mu v squared. So in other words, wow, you get exactly what you would expect for the equivalent one-body problem. It gives you exactly the same result as the real two-body problem. Ooh, ah, just what we would expect. Ah, ooh. Or you could do that too. I'd be equally happy with that. Yes. Ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs>
And now if we use those relations that we derived before, then this turns into minus mu r cross v1 plus mu r cross v2. And that, again, refers back to our earlier relations that r1 was minus mu over m1 times r, r2 was mu over m2 times r. So therefore, if I look at m1 r1, that's minus mu r, and m2 r2 is mu r. So I'm just plugging those in. But V2 minus V1 is what we're calling. Yep, I know there's lots of things here. V2 minus V1 is the velocity of mass 2 relative to the velocity of mass 1, which we are calling the relative velocity and using the symbol simply V, just plain V, just plain V, the relative velocity. So this is mu r cross V. Which one I want to do first, Kepler's second law or Kepler's first law? 
probably Kepler's second law, because it's actually quicker to derive Kepler's second law than it is to derive Kepler's first law. So let's derive Kepler's second law, shall we? How exciting is that? I know, exactly. Yay! Right, so Kepler's second law. Still, it's supposed to be this level. <sighs> okay. Boink. Fun, huh? Have <laughs> second law. Conserve, 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 conserve. It's doing such a 
a good job of it. Mm. From above, if we take the derivative of r cross p, L dot is going to be R dot cross P plus R cross P dot. Because you can use the product rule for cross products. Derivative of the first times the second plus or cross the second plus the first cross the derivative of the second. But V and P are parallel to one another because P is mu V. So now, let's show that in fact, the area, the rate at which area is swept out is actually proportional to the angular momentum. And since the angular momentum stays constant, that means the, air, the rate at which area is swept out stays constant, and that is Kepler's second law. So consider the following. There's our elliptical orbit. There's the focus. There's M at the focus. Cute little mu orbiting it. Let's say the distance is R. Actually, I'll put it. Uh, doesn't matter really, but I'll put it over here. Okay. The R can be either one. We're talking about a very narrow slice here. So 
in the limit as d theta goes to zero, so that those two radii are closer and closer to being the same length as one another, then the idea here would be I can drop a little perpendicular there, and to a very good approximation, the length of that perpendicular is r times d theta, just from the definition of radian angle. R d theta is that little length right there. And that area swept out in going between those two points, as long as theta d theta is very small, looks like a long skinny triangle, does it not? I mean, one edge is curvy, but as you get narrower and narrower, the curviness of the ellipse becomes less and less important. Little did he know. 